There are those on Saturday night who search for the party that ends. And there are those who on Saturday night search for the party that never ends. We search for the party that never ends. And you? The center of all here is Jesus. All the rest, the cathedral, assembly and preacher, are only signum et rimandum of the one truth. Tonight we will try to answer the question, the famous question, but why should we go to church? What is the purpose for going to church? You obviously already know the pattern of my catechesis. First of all comes the word of God, then the teaching of the church, and then life experiences. But tonight I want to start in a very simple and linear way, uh, with an example, or rather with an experience that happened to me whilst I was hitchhiking from France down to Italy together with a young man from Belgium who had an experience with us some time ago. So we have in mind to take a trip with a ship, obviously asking for a ride, so we go towards Corsica, then we find a direct ride to Cagliari, and from Cagliari we went to Palermo and we arrived in Palermo on the ship so the ship gets to the dock and we walk down the staircase on the ship so this man stops me and he tells me with a slight accent he was Sicilian but he had that strange S sorry can I ask you a question he had this strange smile, so I thought, let's see what he wants to tell me. I said, uh, you are not Catholic, right? No, I'm an evangelist, he said. Tell me, what do you want to know? If you today demonstrate to me why I should go to church, and why I should go to Mass, and you demonstrate it to me with the scripture, I will become Catholic today. Ah, I said, well, and here the Lord inspired me immediately because when we pray then the Lord reminds us of things and I remembered an example from scripture now let me ask you a question I said I'm sure that you yourself will find the answer you know the scriptures well so I said oh he was pleased tell me one thing when St. Joseph and Mary lost Jesus, who is the sense of life, because Jesus says, I am life, where did they find this Jesus and this life, the meaning of life, where did they find it? So he thinks, he reflects and then he answers, in the temple. Very good, this is the answer. Then I left and he was with his mouth wide open. I hope he became a Catholic. He said it in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 4. It is written, it's better not to make a promise than to make it without keeping it. Hopefully he keeps it. But even though uh, also just a promise is already a good thing because maybe his conscience during his life will remind him of this moment. A little note, obviously today we will speak about why go to church. Now the church in the full sense are not the stones of the cathedral. This one collapsed already once, so I, I make you a prophecy. I foretell you that in the future it will collapse another time. A prophecy in quotation marks, this one day will collapse, as also the world will pass away. We have to intend the church as in the full sense, as St. Peter said, the one who has the keys of the full truth. It is made out of living stones, the living stones close to Jesus. So in this way we can build up this temple that will never pass away. At the time of St. Augustine when Rome was sacked, there was another saint who said, oh my God, if the church is indestructible, how can it be that this happened now, during the time when Rome was sacked? So St. Augustine answered him in the De Civitate Dei, the city of God. He explains that the church has to be intended above all as the spiritual stones. This is the temple that will never be destroyed. With this short note at the beginning, let's also say that 
Jesus taught in the temple. The apostles taught in the temple. Mary went to the temple. Saint Joseph went to the temple. So there is a reason why we come here to the church. Let's take a look at scripture. Let's start off with the Old Testament. If someone comes to us and tells us, where is it written that I have to go to church? Now it's not enough that I just make an example to have them give birth, to bring them to the answer. If I tell him immediately with the scripture, we reach the goal sooner. We already saw that Joseph and Mary found Jesus in the temple. But if we already begin by the Old Testament, we read that phrase that you often sing here. What joy is it to go to the house of the Lord? The psalm says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord of which St. Paul says it is the Church. So the house of the Lord is the Church, says St. Paul, the pillar and the support of the truth. So what joy when they told me, let us go to the house of the Lord. In Psalm 118 in brackets, verse 16, it says, In your will, O Lord, is my joy. So I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And the other psalm that says, in your will, O Lord, is my joy, means that when I come to church, given that this is joy, to persevere in this is the will of God. Because the psalm says, in your will, O Lord, is my joy. So those who do not go to church, not praying thus publicly, is not fully in the will of God. But gradually one may get to this. And there's also a passage from Isaiah that says, I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. Because if someone comes to church and doesn't pray and is distracted, there's another passage that says in some way that if someone comes to the house of the Lord, whilst he turns his ear to another side, even his prayer is an abomination to the Lord. So prayer has no value if one is distracted. You all pay attention tonight. I'm just saying that there's also a sense for coming to church. Peace. There's a passage of scripture that says, if I'm not wrong, it's Psalm 118 verse 165. Great peace for those who love your law. But there's also another passage that says, this is also regarding to when we come to the church. Many people don't have peace. And so we say, come to the church. What do we do in church? We listen to the word of God. So loving the law of the Lord means for us to have great peace. As it is written in a passage of the Old Testament, in the book of the prophet Haggai, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Greater will be the future glory of this house than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give you peace, says the Lord of hosts. So here in scripture he makes the distinction between Jerusalem and the house where there is peace. If we take a look at Jerusalem, there is no more temple there, just a wall. But peace is being found seldomly there. Here we find it more abundantly as we see. So we will also see in the saints that they make the distinction between the temple and the temple that grows in number, which in the end is the Catholic Church. I read out a passage to you and then we make some examples. Continuing with scripture. There is a passage that says, We remember your mercy within your temple, O God. Now in Hebrew this passage is worded a little differently. But the meaning is given in the 74 translation that says more or less, So your mercy, O Lord, within your temple. That means not that uh, the mercy of God is only within the temple. Because if I go to confession with a priest, I can go there even in the forest or behind the forest. What is important is that we are inside of the rules of the Catholic temple. Those rules that the Lord wanted so that we may receive mercy. That means inside the teaching of the church. It's not by chance that where Joseph and Mary go for the purification according to the law, they go to the temple. So they go to the temple for the purification according to the law of Moses. But we today go to the temple for the purification according to the gospel, which we will see with confession and communion. 
Simeon, you all heard of the wise Simeon. Who is it who pushes Simeon to go to the temple? Do you remember the passage where Simeon goes to the temple, where he then takes baby Jesus in his arms? There's a passage that makes us understand. Moved by the Spirit, Simeon went to the temple. So one may ask, if the Spirit pushes to the temple, and this is the Holy Spirit, in the Jerusalem Bible from the year 74, uh, Spirit is written with a capital S. So the CE, the conference, Episcopal Conference of the Italian Bishops, put that S as a capital S to signify that it's the Holy Spirit that pushes Simeon to go to the temple. And what does he do in the temple? He meets Jesus. And what does he see? He sees salvation. So why do I go to the temple? Because I want to be saved. From what? From sins. I want to be saved from bad things. I want to have peace, as already the Old Testament says. Now we go immediately to two examples. These are not from me, they are from the Bible, from the New Testament. Let's make the example of the prodigal son. This account of the prodigal son, we don't have to read out because we all already know it. We all heard more or less this story from the prodigal son who goes away from home, he spends all his goods, he spends all his money with harlots, then he even has to eat with swine, and then he comes back to his senses. He returns back to the house of his father, because he thinks, uh, at least at the house of my father I can have something to eat. Outside I can only have the food of swine. So he comes to his senses, returns back home, his father celebrates his return. We know this more or less, then he puts a ring on his finger, and so on. What is the key of reading here that the Spirit of God wants to give us today in this Catechesis? Because you will remember that Saint John Cassiano says, when we recount the deeds of the Lord, we praise Him. So we are praying in some way. Do you remember who didn't like that story when the prodigal son came home? The older brother, who said, how is this possible, this one spent all his money. He spent all his money and all your goods, and he was unhappy. What does the daddy say to the older brother, who was unhappy that the other brother returned? Now here we find the key of reading, which will be useful when, we go, when you go to visit friends, or when you are together with some relatives at table, and when they say, no, there's no need to go to church, you can tell them, well, yeah, that's already good, yeah, I already pray. Don't tell them straight away, no, because otherwise you may create a wall straight away. Yeah, you're already on the way. And then if you want, you can give them this key of reading. Now let's make an example. Let's say that only this part here is the church, the house of the Father. And what is the house of the Father? We already said that St. Paul says the house of God is the church, pillar and support of the truth. So the church is the house of God. So this is the house of the Father. The prodigal son was outside. So the father says to the older son, your brother, when he was outside of this house, he was lost. We have to celebrate, because now coming back, he was found again. Your brother was dead when he was outside of the house of the father. When he was outside of the church, he was dead. Now entering back again, he came back to life. And we add, through the embrace, like that of St. Peter's Basilica of Bernini, which is the embrace of reconciliation, through the embrace of holy confession, he returns from death to life. As St. Paul says, when we were dead in sins, he brought us back to life, through a bath of rebirth. So when we read the parables, Let's try to find the right key and we make the right connections with other passages. We can use these accounts from the Bible that many already know to make many people understand what it means to go to church. It means to come from being lost to being found again. It means to come from death to life.
It means to come from bad temper to peace. It means to come from sadness to joy. It means to come from emptiness to the celebration of the heart, to the joy of the heart, the joy of the Father who finds the Son again. All the brothers come together again. Tonight on the street I met someone and I said, tonight we talk about why we go to church. And he said, because we are all brothers. And I said, that's true, because in the house of the Father we remember that we are all brothers and children of the same Father. If we all are in our own homes, we are like many aisles. But when we come to church, things change. But someone could say, that, well, Jesus says that when you pray, you should go to your own room. Pray alone. Later on, we will explain what this room is. According to the Gospel, not according to Valentino. Valentino is here of little use. Now we make another example that you all know, I'm sure. The example of the lost sheep. How often did you hear about this lost sheep? So look here, our 99, let's go outside. We go outside. You already know since you know us. Already 14 years ago, we understood by the grace of God and a little of goodwill the pastoral lead of Pope Francis today and also of the local bishop Antonio Stagliano to be the church outside to live it outside with the aim of bringing people inside so now we've heard about 50,000 times this hermeneutica when you hear this word hermeneutica it comes from the Greek god Hermes who translated the message of the gods and brought it to mankind he was half man and half god some say he was half man and half god some say no however he had sandals at his feet and he tried to fly so he translated this divine message to a human message so when you hear the word hermeneutic it means interpretation. So this is the new hermeneutics, the new interpretation that I want to give you tonight. Are we so sure that 99 are the ones who are here in the church and the one sheep that was lost is outside? Or if we take a look at the text in Greek or in Italian as you wish, maybe it also could be, we say it in the conditional, so to avoid pride. Let's keep the paradox because the interpretations may be manifold. We are sure instead that the 99 are outside and the lost sheep that comes back into the church is the one that is being found again. If we take a look at the diptych of Luke, because Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, so the first part, the Gospel of Luke, tells us the story of the lost sheep. So there were 99 sheep, but not in church. It doesn't say that they were in the house of the Father, but it says that there were 99 hundred in the desert. In the desert. They were not in the house of the Father. They were in the desert, where everything is dry. And one got lost. So the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep in the desert and goes in search of the one lost sheep. He frees it from thorns, protects it from the wolves. One can put a lot of imagery in that. But the text of St. Luke says that the shepherd now, who is the shepherd? Let's immediately say a simple interpretation. Who is the shepherd? Who is the sheep? That person that has a meek character, more or less. A soul that needs to be saved. So, Jesus, so this good shepherd goes. So, Jesus, uh, we already said that Jesus is the whole Christ. Jesus, the head in heaven and his body that is on the earth. He goes in search for this lost sheep. And then the text of St. Luke says, he puts it on his shoulder and he carries it home. So the shepherd goes, picks up the sheep, puts it on his shoulders and carries it to the house. Now, according to the scripture, what is the house? Not according to Volantino, but according to the scripture. What is the house of the shepherd? We already said. Who said this? 
Saint Paul, who says that the house of God is the church, the pillar and support of the truth. So the shepherd picks up the sheep, outside he picks it up. As if it was far away and he carries it to the house of the shepherd. And then he says, there is more joy in heaven for one sheep that has converted than for 99 just who do not need conversion. That means, now comes the key of reading, there is more joy in heaven for just one soul that comes back to church than for 99 righteous, in quotation marks, who do not need to come to church. There is no feast for the people who do not want to come to church after they already started a spiritual walk, because if someone already prays, that's already a grace. Even if one does, does good deeds, it's already a grace, even though they don't go to church. But if one already started to take some steps, but then he doesn't come because he thinks he does the right thing. There's no more feast. The feast is for those who have that metanoia. Metanoia comes from the Greek, it means conversion. When someone converts his way of thinking and comes to the house of the shepherd, which is the church. And then in the house of the shepherd there are all those sheep, an atmosphere of peace, an atmosphere of protection. There you learn from the shepherd. And then one does the same thing as the shepherd and one picks up the other sheep that are lost. And the other ones who are in the desert can see this example and fall in love with this example. So the 99 sheep are not in the church. It is not written in the text. It is written that 99 sheep were in the desert where it is dry. So we search for these lost sheep when we go around. We means not only we little friars not only the priest, not only the bishop. We all are here gathered to have the armor in hand. So the next time we, when you get around, you can tell the story of the prodigal son with the key of reading that opens the heart. In the text of Luke it is written that the shepherd carries the sheep on the shoulder. Then this is obviously the first phase, carrying it on the shoulders or to the earthly house of the Father, and then one day, as Ratzinger said, also to the heavenly house of the Father. Once we were with our bishop in Rome, Bishop Monsignor Dal Cobolo, and we were talking about St. John Bosco, that he was a dreamer, and I said, Yes, His Excellency, we have to dream the will of God, in the sense of uh, searching for the plan that God has for each one of us, which is also the plan to go to church. Because it is here that kids, sons and daughters learn their education, where do you teach education to your children? At home, the Eternal Father, Jesus and Mary, where do they teach us heavenly education? In His house, that is the church. Here they can teach us, right? This is already an ontological thing, it is normal and concrete. Now we come to the problem of the room. This is funny when they tell you. But Jesus tells me that I have to be shut in my room, in secret, and no one has to see me. This is the prayer I have to make. This is the will of God. There's no need to go to church because things have to be done in secret. This is also true, but only a part of the truth. After Palm Sunday, we usually hear this reading very often. Do you remember when Jesus tells his disciples to go to a man and to tell him to prepare his room? He says, my room. He says, my room. Jesus says, my room where I want to have supper. I read the passage out here to understand that this is the Cena Domini, that is, Holy Mass. So the room of the Lord is the church, where we all come together with Jesus, because the best covenants. Where do you make the best trades? Sitting at table, right? 
with a glass of wine. So here, talking on a human level, Jesus makes the eternal covenant at table, in his room, where he wants to celebrate Easter, which comes from the Hebrew word Pasach, which means to pass over, which is not anymore a passing over from the slavery of work to normal life, but is the passing over from the slavery of sin and from the fear of death to the freedom of the eternal life. To understand the room better, the text says, in the Gospel of Mark 14, 14, Jesus says, it's simple, in the Gospel of Mark 14, 14, 14 recalls a little bit Easter because of the 14 generations, tell the housekeeper, that the Master says, Where is my room, so that I can eat the Easter meal with my disciples? Now the Gospel of Luke. And yet, you will tell the housekeeper, says Jesus. The Master tells you, Where is my room, where I can eat the Paschal meal with my disciples? Beforehand we said that uh, if you want to pray, we can pray in the room. But if you want to be in Jesus, and in the body of Jesus, the church becomes our room. It is there that the true Paschal Feast happens, the true passing over. Otherwise it would be just a half passing over that has to be completed. Quickly, I read out to you some passages that Friar Nathaniel put together, because often he collects the passages and I go evangelize all the other way around. We help each other in, in doing these kind of things. These are passages that we know, but at the right moment, with the Bible in hand, we can prove to those who don't want to go to church. As it happened to me tonight, there was a man outside of the cathedral who was convinced that there's no need to go to church. I said, if you believe in the scripture, well, then we have to bow our heads. But if you don't believe in the scripture, we have to start even before that. There he stopped. Because Jesus went to the temple, he taught every day in the temple. St. Peter taught in the temple. Mary went to the temple. But maybe this is an invention of Valentino, so let's better read it out loud. From Mark, Matthew and the Acts of the Apostles, I read them one after the other. As Jesus was teaching in the temple area, he said, someone could say, well, sir, every now and then it could happen. Then he walked the streets, only on the streets. As Pope Francis says, it's true that every day he walked the streets, but also every day, where would he go? Day after day, Jesus said, teaching in the temple area, not once a week, not once a month, every day. Another passage from the Acts, Every day they went all together to the temple. This all together in the Acts of the Apostles is intended for the Apostles and also Mary. All of these were continuously and in agreement in prayer, together with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with some women. The men whom you put in prison are in the temple area and are teaching the people. So they had put them into prison, they escape, and where do they go? The first thing in their mind is to go to the temple. So in the temple, as the saint says, and we will read this out now, there is the possibility to be more recollected. We get less distracted, because at home everybody can come up, like mother, father, child, brother, sister, and we get distracted. When we come here, we have an aim. We are searching a little silence to understand better what God wants from us. So we have already seen, according to the Word of God, from the Old Testament, and also from the New Testament, that there is need also to go to church. Why go to church? Because in church we listen to the Word of God. And then the church is also ecclesia from the Greek and also from the Hebrew word kal, which means a community, an assembly of people put together. A community of people put together by God. Jesus doesn't say the church of men as many think of it, like uh, the church of men, an institution. Jesus says, my church. One day he may tell us with a little Sicilian accent, maybe. Do we have something to say against my church? And Jesus is tough here. He is good and merciful. But St. Francis said that now is the time of mercy. 
After will be the time of judgment. Now mercy, but at this time will come judgment. And each one of us will reap what we have sown. I read a passage of St. John Chrysostom, a few passages from patristic age, and then I make some examples. And then we end this. St. John Chrysostom says, Matter of gold, you cannot pray at home the same way as in church. See, he already makes a distinction. You cannot pray at home as in church. There in church there is something greater. The unison of spirits, the agreement of souls, the bond of charity, the prayers of priests, and so on. Also listen to this of Augustine, this is powerful, short and concise. No one will be suitable for the future life, which is the eternal life, if not now prepared. We praise the Lord when we reunite in church. But at the moment in which each of us returns to our activities, we almost cease praising God. You see, Augustine says that when we come to church, we pray and praise the Lord together. When we return back home to our daily duties, we almost quit praising God because we are taken up by other things. So why do we come to church? Because we help each other to not get distracted. There are, for example, those who already prepared the biblical convention. The one who gives the teaching is a professional. He already passed again over the passages of the scripture. There's a way also to have discussions and get deeper into the arguments together. Even though you would not like what they what is said, but it invites you to get even deeper into the topics. If instead we do our own thing, if it is TV or Facebook, one or this or that, one gets distracted and goodbye time. If you would like to know more about what the fathers say, you can download this sheet freely and you can check it out. Now shortly we talk about the Middle Ages. St. Francis of Assisi, when he with his companions visited the churches, see what we read in the Franciscan Omnibus of Sources. The Lord, says St. Francis of Assisi, the Lord gave me so much faith inside the churches that I simply prayed and said, We adore you, O Lord Jesus Christ, here and in all of your churches, because with your holy cross you have saved the world, you have redeemed the world. And then another passage says this. This speaks about the Franciscans of the early times. Every time they pass close by a church, they bow down in that direction. You just imagine the little friars go evangelize and when they see the cathedral they bow down or they make the sign of the cross. Properly, the sign of respect. Lord gave me much faith inside the churches. Every time they would see a church, they bow down and would make the sign of the cross. Because in the churches it's as if we see the tabernacle of stone and inside there's Jesus who is alive. This is us, this is his body which is the church. It's not only the Eucharist, the Eucharist. This is what the priests say and also Padre Angelo told us that. This is true. There is an epiclesis when they say, this is my body, and then there is the second epiclesis, which is more difficult. That one obeys, the bread just does it, doesn't have a way to choose. Then there is the second epiclesis when the spirit has to come down on us, and that is more difficult to make the miracle happen there, because from a human flesh we have to become a divine flesh. This is a little more difficult, but we can do it if we listen and we try to understand that when we do it, we can rise. Who eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will make him rise on the last day. So it's also a matter of convenience. It's not only that we will rise, if we do Jesus' will, but we will also permit to many others that they will find the way to the resurrection, the way to eternal beauty and to eternal youth, and so on. A little note here from the modern age. From St. Francis to Sales. That's to say that we are going almost through all the eras. What does the Church teach in the several eras in regards to Church? Because in fundamental theology, there's a systematic way. When I want to face a topic, or you want to face a topic, or a dogma of faith has to be established, dogma is the highest thing, it is done this way. So the Church has this method. It takes first all the passages from the Old Testament regarding that topic, 
Then it looks at the Hebrew version and then a new translation of the Septuagint in Greek. Then it takes a look at all the passages regarding that topic in the New Testament, then all the possible knowledge that you can imagine from the patristic age, then all the teachings of the Middle Ages, then from the modern age and then from the postmodern age, so from the contemporary age, and then they establish a dogma. Dogma means that uh, they establish a decree, that either you accept it or you don't accept it. So don't accept it are outside of the church. So we try to pursue a simple way, a systematic and dogmatic. This is what the church thinks, it's not what Valentino thinks. As someone who says that I brainwash the people, I don't brainwash the people. I try to form the intelligence of the people in the light of the scripture. So as the bishop put me here, there must be a reason for it. I'm not a beginner, I don't make up stuff. I demonstrate things. Even if I hadn't studied, I would demonstrate things. Because this is the truth that makes us come out from the box of death. It's not my truth, it's Jesus' truth and that of the church. So St. Francis de Sales says, this is beautiful. Every day, consecrate one hour of your day to prayer. If it is possible, do this in church. There you will find comfort and discreet tranquility, because there neither father, nor mother, nor wife, nor husband, nor anyone else can keep you from being in peace for an hour. When instead at home among all the commitments there could be difficulty in staying at peace for an hour. See, here we do this for an hour more or less. We pay attention and even though if you just receive 8% out of a thousand, as the bishop said when he prayed that we should become 8 for a thousand as St. Conrad, that is holiness, we do receive something if we pay attention and when we are all together. Let's just say a passage from contemporary age and then we will finish with some examples. For example, what does the Second Vatican Council say? Here is the highest form of the magisterium, after dogmas. The Second Vatican Council, where 2,500 bishops, before I was even born, they, they said also this. The liturgical constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium says, On Sundays the faithful have to assemble together, so in the church, in order to listen to the Word of God and to feed on the Eucharist. When it is said once a year is enough a precept once a year, that once a year it is obligatory to feed on the Eucharist, this is simply to maintain the name of Christians. But you just try to eat just once a year. You can and we can say this to others. Try to wash yourself once a year. After a year that one doesn't eat and one doesn't wash, they come to a bad end. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council says every Sunday. Then there is the convention that Ratzinger wanted. We cannot live without Sunday. There are people in the history of the Church that let themselves be killed because they didn't want any statesmen to stop them to go to Mass on Sundays. They preferred to die instead of not going to Mass on Sundays. They let themselves be killed, be killed. But I want Jesus, He's the one who gives me eternal life. Other than needing to convince people to go to Mass, they let themselves be killed. We always have to propose Jesus. Now shortly, I just want to make one example, maybe two. One is that of the light bulbs, the other one is a question that many ask, sometimes with a little bit of malice. Why was Jesus poor? Was the church is rich? Here they have the excuse to not go into church. Ah, they think they are justified. So now I tell you the story of the light bulbs and then the other one and then we conclude this. So, in the car, when we hitchhike, so we often go hitchhike and we often find the same pattern. And I, now uh, I will translate this, 
That means I do better than many others who go to church because I do good deeds. Instead, the others who go to church don't do good deeds and they're good for nothing. So I, who am there in the car, who was just giving me the ride, first I let him talk a little bit. And when I see that he's almost done, he's almost nothing to say anymore. It depends also on the type of person because there are people who don't uh, stop talking. So then I tell them, yes, you know, I would like to tell you something beautiful. Uh, I will make an example to you that you will like for sure. You know, those people who don't go to church and also those who go to church are like two beautiful light bulbs. Let's take the first kind of light bulb that resembles you. You who don't go to church but you do good. And that person, ah oh, yes, he's talking to me. You are for me. It's not a dogma of faith, but for me, you are a beautiful light bulb. This person already gives me a ride, so that's also a person who believes in altruism. Otherwise, they wouldn't give us a ride. So I say, you, for me, are a good light bulb that works almost perfect. Almost, we say, almost. So you lack anything. You have the wires, you have the glass, you have the resistance. It works all. It totally works. If it's then of a 30 or 60 or 100 watt, that's re really that up to God. But this light bulb works. But then I turn on the light over his head and I say, if you don't connect this light bulb to electricity, that's to say that if it's not connected with the electric light of God, that is, with the immortal light of God, this light bulb doesn't give light. So the good that you do, even in Africa, when you go to feed the poor children, your good deeds are good. If you sell your house, you sell everything you have and you carry it to Africa, you resolve the problem of those people for a hundred years. The children didn't die and you let them live for a hundred years, okay. Yet after a hundred years the problem of death comes back again. So you didn't even resolve one problem. You simply made it longer and then the problem of death returns back again. So the good that you do is good, but it doesn't shed light on no one. Instead the person who goes to church and the, the one who listens to me thinks, oh, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. The one who goes to church is like that light bulb that is connected to the electricity, but his resistance in perseverance in doing good deeds is burned out, is broken. So it is connected and goes to church, goes to confession, communion and so on, but they don't do good deeds. This light bulb doesn't shed light on anyone. So we have two light bulbs, one who doesn't go to church and he does good deeds, and the other one who goes to church but doesn't do good deeds. So these light bulbs give light to anyone, neither to these nor to the others. Because one has the wires not connected, nor the other one because it has the resistance in the perseverance of good deeds that is burned out. So if you have two light bulbs like this, what do you do? I make this example to the one who's driving. And he tells me uh, spontaneously, I will throw them away. And I say, the Lord is not this way. But if one in the end insists on that, and they persist, these uh, light bulbs will be thrown away into garbage can. Gehenna, that is when you read in the Bible about Gehenna, that is outside of the walls of Jerusalem, there's the garbage and that is burned up, so it even stinks. Yet the Lord doesn't want to throw away anyone into that garbage can. The Lord wants to make us understand in time. See, you were born, you grow, you breathe, you look and you listen because you need to be a light bulb that works. So do good, be connected to Jesus, who is the light of the world. Are you already connected to Jesus? See that you do good deeds, otherwise I will cut you off. Yet if you do good deeds, then you will become a prince, an immortal king. The Lord is good and merciful, but he's not stupid. Because in the book of Sirach 5, 5, we read, Do not be so confident of mercy that you add sin upon sin. It's true that the mercy of God is eternal. But this is until the end of our life. In the moment when this life ends and our breath ends, there will be the photo and what we are, we are. There is the balance. Let's think of it now. I finish now with this example that you all may have heard. One day I was in Rome, 
And you were invited by the President of the Australian Bishops' Conference, an important person, a bishop. It's been a long time that we know him through Fray Antonio, who is Australian. And so this bishop, every time he came to Rome, he invited us for a cup of tea. He is still alive. Come, let's get a cup of tea. So we go to St. Peter's Basilica. Half an hour before that, uh, we didn't do it on purpose. It wasn't at the time of Christmas. It was kind of like the cookie in the coffee. There was the crib set up in front of St. Peter's Basilica. It was very poor, St. Joseph and Mary and, and all the habits of the time. It was a little bit like a paradox, because there were kind of two kinds of models. The crib totally poor, and then the glorious St. Peter's Basilica behind it. So there's a young man from England who started to talk to Fray Antonio. He said this, though I think the problem was his and not the problem of his friend. But as he didn't want to give a bad impression, he said it this way. He said, you know, my friend in England understands that in front of this example, he should not go to church. And he said, why? He said, because Jesus and with his apostles and then the crib, and he was poor from when he was born until he died. Yet the church is rich, so why? Why should I go to church? And I said, in the first moment, looking at it, it could seem like that. From a distant point of view, it could be almost a scandal. But behind it all, there's a precise reason. And so he asked, what is it? So I can explain it to my friend. He said, don't worry, uh, I see that you are a wise man. Because you will answer to the question that I ask you now. Tell me, when the Magi kings went to find Jesus there at the crib, you already know the story of Jesus, so you will explain to your friend. What was it that the Magi kings brought to baby Jesus? Then he started to think about it. And he said, he was about to say three things, and he started to say, gold. And I said, stop. What was it that they brought to the feet of Jesus? Gold. Stop there. So was there gold, yes or no, in the crib? So his face changed. And I said, wait, wait, I, I haven't finished yet. So this was, was at the beginning of the life of Jesus. Now we go to the end. When Jesus left from the earth, in that circumstance when uh, the Holy Spirit then came down, and so on, then the apostles, there it came down abundantly, but it still comes down. Let's say during the time of Pentecost, all those who came to faith sold their houses, their land, everything they owned. Just imagine if only we all who are here would do this. That what our parents left us and inheritances and everything. Now I haven't got anything uh, there, I have nothing to sell, but all those who sell put it at the feet of the apostles. If you consider just a few that we are here, it would be a big amount of money here that we could go to Africa and do a lot of good. All those who came to faith, as the Acts of the Apostles say, they sold everything and put it at the feet of the Apostles. Do we get this? We, they put it at the feet of the Apostles. So I told this guy that the church from the beginning was rich. But St. Peter gives us the right key of reading. When he goes to the temple and finds the crippled man, he says to him, I have neither gold. So he didn't have gold. The gold was not of the church. So I have no gold nor silver, but what I have I will give you in the name of the Lord. So this wealth is not of the church. It is substantially in the church, but for those who were in need. That's what the Acts of the Apostles say. Then that the church in the history is holy and also meritrix. That means holy in the teaching and the sinner in the events. Not in all, because they are also the saints. We all know this, so there's no need to break through a door. But the church, biblically speaking, objective speaking on the basis of the Bible was rich even from the beginning it had everything that was given to it in order to give it to those who did not have anything then also deacons were made uh, from the word diakonos which means a servant to render this service so what I'm telling you here I told to this bishop and this bishop told me, well, you, you always have an answer for everything. And I said, Your Excellency, I pray. Obviously, I said, also you pray. But it's simply that when we walk the streets and people ask us, they see us so close at hand, so they dare to ask these kind of questions. When I pray, it's not just that I take the liturgy. It's not that I take the liturgy and I said, oh, how beautiful. 
Here's the asterisk. It's true that the asterisk uh, has me stopped, but I also have to try to reflect on what is written there to help my brothers according to the scripture, because all want the scripture, so we give it to them, to all those who search for the truth, where we find an answer. So showing them the truth in the scripture, if then someone contradicts it, we say, excuse me, it's written, majesty and beauty inside your sanctuary. The scriptures tell us about sacred vessels. It is written about golden cups. It is written about sacred decorations and precious stones. So then what do you want? Do you know why the church is rich? Externally also rich. Because then its purpose is to help the poor. The poor in spirit and also in material goods. The ancients said that it is the mystery of the moon. I said this even when I had no studies. To a guy who had a, a longer experience with us, look at the full moon at night. What is its purpose when it shines in the night? The moon in the night, scientifically speaking, reflects the glory of the light of the sun. So also the Catholic Church, when you see its vestments, the Pope, the Cardinals, the Bishops, the vestments, the glorious Church and so on. It reflects the light of the glory of God that awaits us in heaven. This here is only a shadow. St. Francis of Assisi did not reject this, because these here are vestments like those of horses, that show you more or less what is on the other side. But there's always that classical Judas, who has to complain. But it's not right that you put 300 coins at the feet of Jesus. You always have the poor. When you want it, you can always do a good deed to them. But if you have to build up a temple, we need money. And the free contribution given to the priest, uh, we simply need this temple to pray here all together. And if there were more people, how could one do that if there's not such a big building? It is normal, it's something that is very close at hand. Yet the church is not only that, the church is above all. To come here in order to understand, so then to go out to help and to come here to understand how we get to the eternal life. A short summary, now I will be a little naughty. Now if someone tells us why should I go to church, what do we tell them? Excuse me, why should I go to church? What is the purpose? Psalm 31, 9 says, tells us, and says to the people who do not want to stop in front of the objective truth of the scripture, be not like mules and horses without intelligence. I could be the first one to say, hey, we, we are poor. We don't touch money because we live without money, effectively. So I could leave, but no, because the people are in need of this and we give it to them. Okay, here is the poor church, without money. It lives by divine providence, goes walking and hitchhiking, walks around to evangelize. All that the Gospel points out to us, that Pope Francis tells us and the Bishop, we try to live it all. Also, when the Gospel says, when you go, don't carry anything with you, neither gold, nor silver, nor bag, nor a second pair of sandals, nothing. So, as you see as we go, to Spain, Portugal, China, to Australia, everywhere. But we do not boast, because what we're interested in is the church. So, a guy in the uh, tells me whilst I'm explaining to him the scripture. We were in Ispica, I, I speak about 14 or 15 years ago. He said, this is what the church should do. This is what the church should do. It should explain to us the Bible, even coming into your car. I stopped, even though I often was misunderstood by brothers in the church. I didn't say, yes, yeah, true, this is what it should do. I didn't say that, didn't say that. I answered, uh, and who am I? Am I not church? Because here in this moment, is it not the church that is working here? It's the church that here is explaining to you the word of God, it's not me. Because I'm a baptized person first of all, and for now a friar. And he shut his mouth. 
So if someone meets you, he meets the church, because you are the church, we are the church, we are ecclesia, we are people who want to understand more, in order to witness to the others this beautiful experience that we are having in the church, and of which the Lord confirms us day after day that this is not a tale, but a great mystery. Because in the church you find joy, peace, the burning fire in your heart, providence. I remember that when I was a manager, not a friar, as a manager, when I made a lot of money, I had no peace. I didn't have peace. It seemed almost as if I had horns on my head. I was always angry. My sister, also that of blood, um, because you are all brothers and sisters. One day she said to me, I just need a miracle to go to church. Just one. And which one? I just need a miracle. You need a miracle? You don't need a miracle. I'm your miracle. She said, it's true. When I came to church for the first time, I remember there was Father Mansueto, which means meek. He was first here in Noto and then in Ispica at St. Mary Major. I remember that when I entered the church, I at the time was reading the Bible alone. Dragons, lions, swords, caresses, turn the other cheek, wars with spears. Altogether I was confused, how does this work? I didn't understand almost anything. Then I went to church and I was listening to the priest and it was the church speaking to me. When he spoke, he was balanced. And I said, wow, I see a balance here. And I was amazed. And for six months I participated at Mass on Sundays just to understand if God exists. Because I was amazed by that balance. So the balance that the Catholic Church has, believe me, because I get around very much, because I also studied Eastern religions, I have never seen getting around such a balance as in the Catholic Church. With my own eyes I have never seen such a thing anywhere. The unity that is present in the Catholic Church I have never seen with my own eyes in any other place. The brotherhood and the love that you find in the Catholic Church. With all the failures that we may have, I have never seen such a thing in any other place. For this reason I come to church. First of all, because it's the will of God. And in the second place, because you see the fruits. So the glory of this house, says the Lord, will be greater than the glory of former times. And in this place I will give peace. What a joy when they told me. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. On the next Saturday we will talk about that it's not enough to go to church. But why do we have to go to confession with the Catholic priest? Can I not just stand in front of the crucifix? Forgive me, Lord Jesus, forgive me. And the Lord makes me understand in some way. Go to confession and I forgive you. So we will explain that in a little more scientific way and simple way. And step by step, according to a systematic rationale. So about the thought of the Old and the New Testament. And according to the whole history of the Catholic Church. Amen. Now Piero will go around with the scriptural passages. And they will end with a final song. And I truly thank you, uh, above all, for one thing. For the presence here and all those who sing and the brothers and sisters. Who were at work the whole week. Thanks also to you who have invited other friends and so on. And I thank you also for your attention. Because this is the secret. Secret, to be attentive. All depends on that. Because those who come to the house of the Lord and turn their ear to other things, instead you paid attention. So now we can all together help many others. And if you do not remember anything that we said here, even about the catechesis from last Saturday, Fra Piginito, who is in Rome, who is doing his doctorate there, he is preparing these videos. He puts these video recordings together, cutting out all the things that are not useful. As I speak, he puts in the sources. There's a short summary also on PDF file. So if you like a passage, you just go there and you download it, you print it and you can use it. All for free. All for the love of God. And this is thanks to God, thanks to the Pope, and I have to say this with all my heart, thanks also to our Bishop Stagliano, how amazing this Bishop is. When people sometimes speak badly about this Bishop, I feel pity for them, not for the Bishop, but for those who speak badly about the Bishop. You don't even know this person, how can you speak about him? Because he may be taken up by many thoughts that he has to do so many things. He has a beautiful heart. If you take him by his heart, he gives you everything. He is a person who truly loves Jesus. Otherwise, we couldn't explain the fact that he permits us to do what Jesus asks us to do in the Gospel. And he wants it with all his heart. Amen. Amen.
quando passa tutto si trasforma viene l'allegria per te e per me Gesù è qui e passa in mezzo a noi Gesù è qui e passa in mezzo a noi e quando passa tutto si trasforma Dio la tristezza viene l'allegria e quando passa tutto si trasforma viene l'allegria per te e per me chi è che ama Gesù ama chi è che salva Gesù salva chi è che